So our first speaker today, and there has been a little bit of jockeying around, but our first speaker today, and you know, it's such a, a cliche to say this stuff, but really needs no introduction, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. Um, Ian Kiernan is the founder and chairman of Clean Up Australia, and that's an organisation that has just mushroomed, and now it's Clean Up the World. And as I said before, my understanding of what drives Ian Kiernan is he saw the filth in the oceans and it just depressed him so much. And this comes back to what I was saying before about the power of one. You don't have to accept what you get. You don't have to just be part of the, the status quo. You can actually stand up and make a difference. And whether that's happening on a village scale, a town scale, a statewide scale, or whether you actually develop something that expands to such an enormous degree that you're influencing worldwide policies, you're still having your impact. And you're still fulfilling your potential as someone who can make a difference. Recently in um, central west of New South Wales, I went to a women's conference where I met the woman who set up wires. And she just started as somebody who was working with national parks. And then tiny, tiny little dolly steps, she's established this organisation that has expanded to such a degree that people now call wires before they call anyone else when they find an injured animal. There are lots of people who do this, but today it's our pleasure to welcome to Facets 2012 our first speaker, Ian Kiernan. And Ian, I'd ask you, ask you to come and join us on the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you for the welcome. And I would like to acknowledge our Wiradjuri people who, uh, whose land we stand upon or share, share with them. Now, I'm sorry that I don't have an electronic uh, presentation, but my uh, server has crashed. It's like being deaf and dumb. It's not very comfortable. So it's back to the old-fashioned printed one. And I know I'm not meant to read it, so I'll try not to. But uh, we've got to realise that uh, we live in a rapidly changing world, changing largely because of us, because of humanity. And what it means is that we have got to change or put aside uh, yesterday's methods and behaviours and develop and embrace new ones that are more uh, suitable uh, to, towards a sustainable future. We have got to support and embrace uh, new and evolving environmental technologies. I've had the, uh, the great honour of uh, chairing two cooperative research centres Firstly, for the CRC for Waste Management and Pollution Control, and then after that, when that hit at sunset, uh, for the CRC for Environmental Biotechnology. And I am fascinated by science. I really love it. And uh, I'm, I'm not qualified as a scientist, but I really am a fan of it. And when I see these wonderful technologies emerging that are going to solve or are solving environmental problems, while the, the owners of the technology, the corporations that own them, are making money, I find this equation to be absolutely excellent. And um, if I talk about a sustainable future, well, let's put that into context. What is a sustainable future? Uh, or go back one step further. What does sustainability mean to you? To me, it is a philosophy under which we respect our place in the world. We are a species that will have a finite time on this planet. We have a, respons a responsibility to leave this earth that has sustained us, uh, and we have a responsibility to leave it in as good a shape uh, or better than when, when we first evolved. It would be even better if we could achieve this, but it's unlikely to happen uh, given the current situation. We seem to, because uh, we have this attitude, we seem to think that we are some sort of supreme being uh, and that we own the earth. Well, I think we would be far better off uh, to follow the example set by our Aboriginal people. 
under which they believe that they are not the owners of the earth, but rather belong to it and are a part of a complex and diverse uh, ecosystem. The practice of this philosophy is one that I want to explore with you in this, this morning. I'm absolutely fascinated by our, our Aboriginal uh, heritage and, and inheritance. Uh, I mean, they lived here so, so effectively and so comfortably for millennia. And then we wandered in in thick red coats and stupid hats. And, uh, and uh, I have um, read with great interest what Tench, uh, in his particular book, 1788, he was a captain lieutenant in the Marines um, with the First Fleet, and he was a man of letters. He could write, which was unusual. So that his publications were available long before the, uh, the well-equipped scientists and historians. He was years ahead of them. And uh, it's fascinating reading, and I commend it to you. And he went uh, with the Aboriginal people out to discover the juncture of the Hawkesbury and Nepean, uh, which they did. And on the third night out, the Aboriginal people put on a, essentially a corroboree because they are wonderful uh, artists, if you like, and wonderful mimics. And in this corroboree, they, they mimicked every stupid bumbling move of the red coat stumbling through the, and not understanding the land. To me, that cap really captures it. And, um, <clears throat> but, um, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> if we look at exploring uh, this, this world as we know it, I think that we should start with the production of what we consider to be a basic necessity, energy. That's why I'm on reading from paper today, because energy failed me <laughs> and the server crashed. But um, it is claimed that coal is a chief source of energy. Any miners here today? I mean, I love the mining industry, we need it, but uh, you're going to find out that I'm not too keen on coal. Um, and when we claim that uh, coal is a cheap source of energy, that is absolutely incorrect if you consider the true cost of coal production and its emissions. It starts with what is often uh, invasive exploration followed by the, by the creation of a working lunar landscape as we extract millions of years of captured carbon for transportation to centralised furnaces that burn it to generate energy with, with byproducts of masses of escaped heat, gases and sediments. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? The industry is proud that they can effectively extract the equivalent of millions of years of compressed carbon sediment in a matter of hours. We are universally appalled by the destruction of our own forests, no doubt about that, and so we should be. What seems to escape the community's attention is that coal mining is as singly responsible for long-term environmental degradation as is deforestation. It's just not uh, as emotional an issue as the destruction of forest giants because we as a species believe that we are entitled to the energy harnessed within coal. To suggest that Australia should be exempt from global action such as carbon pricing because we only admit 2% of the world's emissions is totally naive. 2% is the same as Italy, yet we have only half of their population. And that's before you consider the coal we mine, sell and ship to distant ports across China, India, Asia and beyond. Or all of the, or all of the single use products we make the byproducts of which are accumulating faster than we can effectively dispose of them. Or the impact of the chemicals we now need to produce our food, simply because we have depleted soil fertility through poor agricultural practice. It's a shame that the power of industries embroiled in such short-term thinking have so much influence over the will to manage and limit our contribution to a global solution. On the face of its on the face of it, energy production from the vast reserves of coal looks like a cheap source. But what is its real cost? The coal industry is a massive contributor to CO2 emissions, yet it seems to be immune to any efforts to hold it to account. This industry appears to have dis disproportionate influence over political decision-making when weighted against their impact on the environmental and local communities. And let's not forget mining byproducts, arsenic, other heavy metals and the high levels of salinity from mine runoff 
that is poisoning our land and entering our river systems. Not to mention degradation of uh, farmlands, aquifers and hydraulic systems. We are seeing examples of displacement of the food bowl to allow short-term expansion of an industry that is frankly out of touch and out of vogue. When mining departs, it leaves the land and often the hydraulic system destroyed. You only have to fly across the Hunter Valley of New South Wales to see this lunacy firsthand. Farmers are being forced off the land by the corporate greed of mining corporations, many of the multinationals, supported by state and federal government because it's jobs, it's votes, it's income, it's all of those things. How much coal can you eat? Not too sure about that one. Why, why, why are we happily selling the environmental future to, of next generations? Why do we accept it is okay for the coal industry to destroy our hydraulic systems, our farm and grazing lands for a 20 to 50 year window of jobs and profits? It seems to me that what is lacking in the current debate is, is its incentive to change. Our largest market, China, is under no illusion here. While they may well be buying our coal as fast as we can extract it, this is a short-term proposition. China is way ahead of Australia in the R&D of renewable energy production to support their growing population. Coal is just an interim measure of energy production. They even have the foresight to buy large tracts of Australia's agricultural land to support food production for import into China. And we seem to think this is a good idea. It is incredibly short-sighted as well as being of short-term uh, commercial benefit. If we added up the lifetime of all of us here today, we would not come close to having enough time to replace sediment that formed the energy source on which our GDP is based. It is clear to me that the complexity of the challenge facing us will be best addressed by a range of simple actions that encourage us to live in harmony with the environment. I we've received many awards at Clean Up, and every time I accept one, I accept them on behalf of you, if you are one of the supporters of the, of the, uh, the Clean Up philosophy. And we have more than 7,000 clean up sites across Australia, so it's, it's pretty far reaching. And uh, I was awarded an honorary doctor of science through the University of New South Wales, and I was greatly honoured by this. But any time I've won an award, I've always looked at how I can uh, leverage it for the benefit of clean up in the long term. Uh, I mean, when I was Australian of the Year, I went everywhere I possibly could to uh, broaden the reach of clean up, and it seemed to work quite well. So I thought, well, a doctor of science, I mean, I'm a builder. Now I'm an environmentalist and now I'm a doctor. Just what is going on? <coughs> but I thought, well, what do doctors do? Well, they write formulae and they write equation. And I thought, well, because I am firmly of the belief that the environment is the absolute primary issue and is, has got to be at, at the base of every single decision we make, what we eat, how we clothe ourselves, how we transport ourselves, <coughs> how we live, everything has got to have the environment at its base. So Dr Ian's equation is E equals 1, with uh, due apologies to Albert Einstein, but I truly believe that he would have got my equation as well, because E does equal 1. And we live in a nuclear age, and we have that huge nuclear furnace overhead, that has the ability to provide more than just a beautiful sunset. It can deliver sufficient energy to keep us all adequately supplied into the foreseeable future. The skill which we have in this country, but seem keen to ignore, is to capture and uh, harness this ab abundant power source. And let's not forget the geothermal heat created by the core of our wondrous planet. Hot rock rocks are more than a culinary delight in your local Japanese restaurant. The technology of pumping water into one aperture to create steam that escapes through another drilling to drive turbines is true rocket science. And as a sailor, I really understand wind. What I cannot understand is our reluctance to harness the potential energy production of this natural source. You only have to stand on a street corner on a windy day to feel the massive energy as a gust of wind hits you. You only have to be around 
yesterday afternoon to, to see that same power. And uh, community angst about turbine noise, bird deaths and unsightliness has got to be put aside. It is manageable. And it is certainly a far better alternative to burning coal. This is not new technology. Uh, the clean-up offices uh, are on Observatory Hill. And uh, if, you, if you look at the, at the chart of, of the City of Sydney, it's known as Windmill Hill because that's where our first windmills were. And uh, we know that farmers across our vast land have been using wind energy to extract water and grind, grind grain for centuries. The massive strength of ocean waves and currents is now being harnessed through the use of innovative technology. And I, explored, I, I applaud experimentation by CSIRO and other agencies which have established projects in Port Kembla, New South Wales, Perth, West Australia. Uh, another example of harnessing nature's existing potential energy production. Mother Nature, the greatest scientist of all. Uh, I mean, ignited emissions like methane, uh, more commonly known as biogas from landfill or cement production and other ignitable industrial emissions, including human waste, is another area we need to include in our sustainability mix. Which brings us to the waste industry, which has traditionally buried solid waste in landfill and dumped liquid waste in our oceans. The old attitude was, how much dirty water can I buy from you? And where can I bury this waste? Well, those days are behind us, fortunately. And today, the leading waste companies have evolved into resource recovery operators as they harness the heat and flammable gases from decaying organic waste, as well as recovering the recyclables. The conversion of plastics back to usable oil is another practical example of clever energy production. So there it is. My E equals world one is about an equation where humanity captures the energy we need for an energy rich future from solar, subterranean, wind, wave and waste energy. That's what the future is about. We have the technology, we just have to change the expectations and behaviours of the human animal. So my fellow homo sapiens, uh, it's much better to call you that than the previous, uh, <laughs> I invite you to join me in this quest. Every one of us and can and should become more energy conscious today. Start with solar, maybe hot water. It's the single greatest user of energy within your rising bill. And when you think about it, we go and heat this water up and we keep it hot day and night and day and night and on holidays and all of this time, burning up huge amounts of energy. There is a better way and solar is certainly that. Uh, and and uh, have you ever thought about the wonder that solar cells or the installation of a small wind turbine on your roof? It's not fanciful. It is practical and possible now. What's the velocity of that creek that runs through your property? You can get a water turbine to feed into your grid. There are so many things that you can do. Go looking, go looking, go investigating. One thing for certain is that energy is not going to get cheaper and our consumption of it is only likely to increase. Another certainty that our energy f future must not rely on coal production. Why is this important? Because A equals one. And the future, it's in your hands. Thanks so much. <laughs>